Perfect. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, my name is Garth Willis. I'll be the moderator of this panel. And I'm a Foreign Service Officer at USAID, where I'm in Washington, D.C., working on the digitization agenda at USAID. Um, so a little bit of background. Two years ago, almost to the day, USAID launched its first digital development strategy um, to sort of raise the prominence of digitization across all of our sectors. And it's been an incredibly busy two years for um, the agency to, to get digitization sort of embedded into everything we do. The strategy has two mutually reinforcing objectives. Overall, just to improve the development and humanitarian assistance outcomes through responsible use of digital, digital technology, but to do this through openness, inclusiveness, and security of country um, digital ecosystems. So it's a big challenge. We have massive um, um, opportunities, but of course, threats um, along with that. The strategy, of course, is only as good as the staff that implement it. And today, and as part of the strategy, we, we created a cadre of digital development advisors. This is a, a small cadre that's growing, and we're looking to see it have spread throughout USAID missions globally. And these digital development advisors are responsible for implementing the strategy um, through all the different technical offices, whether it be health, education, um, democracy and governance, agriculture, and providing support to make sure that each sector responsibly and um, efficiently implements digital solutions. And they also lead the digital um, ecosystem country assessments, which USAID is rolling out globally to really give anyone that's looking at a country a roadmap of the digital ecosystem and how USAID works within that ecosystem. So today we have four DDAs representing missions in Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and Eastern Europe. And each will present a little bit about the context they work, some of the activities they're working on, and the challenges and solutions um, they, they bring to the table. And afterwards, I'm looking to have like at least 30 minutes of good um, sub substantive uh, question and answer period. So without further ado, I will pass to the first DDA, Anela Simic from Bosnia-Herzegovina. Thank you, Anela. Thank you very much, Gard. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Anela Shemic, uh, DDA for BIH and Project Management Specialist at Economic Development Office. Thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. I'm very happy to share our experiences with you. Uh, but before I start talking about the interesting part, uh, I would like to share with you some uh, general information about Bosnia and Herzegovina to help you understand the context better. Uh, so it is a small country located on Balkan Peninsula in southeastern Europe. It has only 3.5 million people, but highly complex government structure with one country, two entities, one district, 10 cantons, more than 100 municipalities, and so on. Um, as a result of such a complex structure, government institutions uh, whose work is recognized as relevant for shaping the digital ecosystem in BIH exist at different le levels of gover governance. And one of the biggest issue due to this structure is that there is almost no interoperability between government layers. layers. Uh, another challenge for digitalization process in BIH is the lack of legal framework for digitalization and in some cases uh, non-harmonizing exi existing legislation with the EU directives, uh, like in the case of e-signature. Uh, the biggest issue that arises from the uh, aforementioned problems and other as well is a serious brain drain taking place in our country as we speak. But I have to say that uh, our colleagues in the mission and myself, we are very focused on, on uh, progress, on making results, making progress, making positive impact. And I'm, I have to say that I'm very lucky to work in a mission where colleagues are aware of the importance of digital. I joined the mission a year ago and my colleagues uh, have already had digital component in almost every activity. 
A few examples are the e-governance activity that ensure, ensures the building blocks for digitalization of public administration in BIH. Uh, then tourism activity is using digital transformation initiative initiative for the promotion of BIH rich culture and magnificent landscapes, escalating BIH to become one of the most desirable touristic destinations. If you haven't, I recommend you to visit this beautiful country. Um, we also have a new media engagement activity focused on digital space. Assistance to citizens in fight against corruption uh, developed the web platform named We Monitor Tenders that helps the beneficiaries, primary uh, citizens and researchers, journalists, institutions, and the general public to follow the public procurement processes and uh, identify the risky ones with the elements of corruption. And these are just few examples, of course. Um, as I mentioned before, I joined the mission a year ago. So DECA, Digital Ecosystem Country Assessment that Gart mentioned Few, 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 mom few moments ago was the first logical step for me because I wanted to make suggestions that are data-driven and more precise. We organized a meeting with every COR and AOR colleague to hear what their opinions and issues in everyday work are, which provided valuable inputs and great engagement from colleagues, really. Um, we are currently in um, the final stage of the interview phase. Uh, and uh, yeah, I have to I have to mention that that kind BIH is conducted with our MEL activity measure, led by another Anela, and uh, with additional help from uh, from one international and one local expert, Troy and Sadik, making one really amazing team. Uh, so far, we interviewed we interviewed uh, 107 stakeholders from various interest groups, to whom we are grateful for their their, their uh, um, time and readiness to share their experiences with us. Uh, it was really a huge team effort with great support from colleagues in Washington, which we really, really appreciate. Um, also what DECA team suggested, and I as the activity manager accepted, is that our national survey of citizens per perceptions should be updated with ad additional questions related to digital, which will provide, uh, uh, provide us additional data source to support our final report. That is the additional value to BIH DECA. Uh, another important fact that I wanted to share is that both the stakeholders and the public are embracing USAID's awareness of potential risks digitalization can bring and our commitment to uh, actively work on mitigation of those risks. We are taking in consideration this co cross-cutting segments of digitalization, such as digital literacy, cybersecurity, and inclusion. And from their reaction, I could see that they honestly appreciate and embrace USAID's human-centric design and our commitment to ensure open, inclusive, and secure digital ecosystem. The network of DDAs represent a great opportunity for increased digital implementation in USA's programming in our missions. Sharing experiences among DDAs can be of great value for other mission colleagues to get insight from other missions and adapt su success stories to, to, to local context. And instead of conclusion, um, allow me to express hope that all interest groups of BIH society will understand how uh, that digitalization holds immense potential to help people live freer, healthier, and more prosperous lives. And all of us should focus our work on it to leverage that potential. Thank you very much for, for now. I'm, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Anella. And, and Bosnia Herzegovina, for the number of people and the size of the um, the country, has I think the most complexity of the political environment, um, perhaps in the world, and um, and I know digitization is is a major force of the mission there. Okay, next we have Chow from Vietnam. I look forward to hearing your comments. Thanks, Garrett. Uh, hello, my name is Chow. I'm the digital advisor for USAID Vietnam. 
So um, many of you already know Vietnam, so I will not bring up many uh, uh, <laughs> uh, introduction about the country. Uh, at, at our mission, we have a robust digital portfolios. Um, uh, however, I'm a digital advisor focusing on governance and economic growth mostly. So my role is to support the mission to effectively adopt the USAID digital strategy, mostly in governance and economic growth. Although I will try to expand, um, extend my, my support to other offices as well, but my main focus will be governance and economic growth. Um, digital components are well integrated in most of uh, our programs in economic growth and governance. Uh, we try to uh, help Vietnam to build e-governance creating and enabling digital business environment, building digital workforce, and um, improving capacity for local businesses uh, in digital transformation. Uh, for example, we have programs that focusing 100% to digital, like the e-government uh, capacity building program, which we have uh, improve the operation of Vietnam's national public service portal. Uh, Others program, we, we have other programs that digital is just one component of the overall uh, program objective, uh, but it's still, uh, it still produced uh, a lot of impact. For example, uh, our um, capacity building program for local businesses like Links SME and IPSC, we all, uh, we all have components to enhance capacity of small and medium-sized businesses on digital transformation and digital literacy. Uh, our program objectives are to help Vietnam achieve its ambitious goal to become the regional high-tech high hub and a high-income country by 2045. So it's quite, we are quite lucky because there's a lot of opportunity for us to implement digital program in Vietnam because the government of Vietnam is really embracing uh, industrial revolution and a digital transformation. However, uh, the country also have a, a lot of challenges for us uh, to implement digital uh, uh, programs. The first, um, challenge that we have is the overly complex uh, institutional framework. Um, so digital in Vietnam regulated by at least eight different ministries. Uh, and it makes very difficult for us to implement a comprehensive uh, programs or policies. Second is the lack of enabling legal framework for digital economy. Um, the legal framework in Vietnam, especially related to public administration, are still very favors of uh, paper documents, uh, wet ink signature and stamps. Therefore, digital transformation and e-governance uh, face a lot of legislative obstacles. Uh, for example, with uh, many services we want to digitize cannot be realized because citizens and businesses still had to bring paper or paper documents and original copies to the government offices, uh, although they already uploaded all the document online um, because uh, the regulation does not accept digital evidence. So it's, it's really a challenge for us in our e-government program. Last but not least is the digital device and resistance to change. Digital divide are quite substantial in Vietnam, especially uh, gender and uh, financial divide. Now, digital transformation in Vietnam mostly focus on big cities and uh, industrial hub. Therefore, program our, in our program design, we will try to have to be flexible and tailor the needs to different group of stakeholders. Resistance to change is another major challenge to our programs in digital both in public and private sector, because workers and government officials, they don't want to change their way of doing business. Therefore, in our digital program, we usually include a component called change management or awareness raising. Um, despite the, uh, the challenges, uh, we apply several strategies uh, to ensure that we can promote the digital agenda. 
first, uh, the, the first strategy is uh, think globally, but act locally. In our program, we try to utilize internet, international expertise and uh, best practices. However, we always want to make sure to tailor our programs to fit the needs of the countries, as there's no, no one size fit all model. You cannot bring US model to Vietnam as well as EU model to Vietnam. You, you just introduce a model to the Vietnamese and you work with the local uh, stakeholder and find out the, the, what works best for the country. Uh, second, uh, utilizing local expertise. Our programs normally try to maximize the utilization of local expertise to ensure sustainability and effective management. So or when in recruiting expertise, we usually ask uh, in, uh, our IPs to make sure they already utilize all local expertise at the maximum level so that local expertise can work together with international expertise and um, to ensure the sustainability of the program. Uh, last strategy that we have is co-creation and adaptive management. Co-creation is really high in our, that's one of the top priority of our mission because we want to listen to our stakeholders in all programs and make sure our program responds to the needs of the stakeholders. Um, secondly, Adaptive management is really crucial to digital program because digital environments change rapidly during the life cycle of USAID projects, normally last from three years to five years. And that's for therefore our staff, USAID staff and implementing partners have to be always have to be creative and flexible um, in managing our program and um, to ensure the successful implementation of the programs. Uh, so that's all from uh, my experience. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to listen from all of you and uh, happy to, if you have any question, I'm very happy to answer it. Thank you. All right, thank you, Chow, very much. Um, I know from our, our conversations that Vietnam at, on one hand wants to be a, a tech leader for the region, on the other hand, they have a government that just isn't able to adapt and, and be the leader. So it's, I mean, that's where I think USA can, can have a tremendous sort of advantage to support the government make the, to make the changes it needs. Um, and that's why it's great to, that you're there, of course. Um, all right, moving on, let's go to uh, Rwanda. And no, no, we're heading to um, West Bank and Gaza to speak with Fadi, sorry, please. Thanks, Garth, and uh, thanks everybody for attending this session. Uh, I'm Fadis Yam. I'm the uh, Digital Development Advisor for the Middle East. So uh, when I talk about the Middle East, it's the region where we have, um, we're covering 10 missions. Uh, we're talking about the total population of like around 250 million uh, people. And um, just like I'm going to go like give you a, give a quick brief about the region, then, my, then I'm going to focus on West Bank Gaza since I'm, since I'm stationed at West Bank Gaza. So as you know, like um, there is a very high percentage of uh, youth and young people in this region. Um, it's estimated that more than 28 percent of the population in the Middle East region is between the age of five, 15 to 29. And as you know, like usually young people are much more uh, receptive of using technology ra rather than older older generations sometimes and they're more like you know they're more tech savvy and we we think and we believe that there's also there's an opportunity for to engage with those um, your, uh, young people into more into technology in the future uh, there's a, an increase significantly uh, high penetration rate in terms of using uh, social media platforms and uh, and also there's a lot of uh, there's a high penetration rate in using uh, mobile and the uh, use of mobile mobile data and both that internet. Uh, like if you look at the region, there's increasing interest in the region from many uh, from many Western countries and tech companies. Uh, there's a high interest in uh, like in uh, the tech sector in Tunisia, for example. Uh, many of the French co French companies are investing in the uh, startup ecosystem in Tunisia. Uh, if you go also to the to the east a little bit, like Egypt, uh, with a, a huge country with a 104 million people, 
where also the startup ecosystem is evolving. Um, there's a, a, a payment platform called Fawi. It's the, the first uh, company in, the, in, the, in, in Egypt to be a unicorn. And now it has a market value of $1 billion. And it's providing its services in Egypt and uh, also it's expanding into another, con another, another countries in, in the region. And I think one of the things to learn from this example for, for like it, it, it was able and successful to reach out to the marginalized communities to in Egypt and to make them use more uh, digital payments. So let, let me talk also a little bit about my, my journey with the digital development and uh, the digital strategy. I started uh, my fellowship at, um, at the ITR hub, which is in, in the information technology and research hub uh, at uh, USAID in, in Washington, DC. And then I was one of the first adopters of the digital strategy and I worked on the first DECA for Kenya. And I was, I was inspired by how the uh, digital payments and digital wallets uh, in Kenya and Nairobi and the digital, the Mpasa, how Mpasa was able to uh, bridge the gap and provide more inclusiveness for remote uh, areas in, in Kenya. And this is, I th actually think that we can see that it's, uh, it's happening uh, in many parts of the world. And even here in, in West Bank Gaza, we look at, um, at different ways of different uh, uh, financial inclusion. So currently what we're doing here in West Bank Gaza, um, we're trying to conduct a couple of assessments to look more into the digital economy. And we're trying to, the, to cover uh, different pillars under the digital economy and the digital framework in general. So we're looking at the um, digital skills, we're looking at the digital payments and the fintech, we're looking at uh, the uh, entrepreneurship ecosystem, we're looking at the regulatory, regulatory environment, we're looking at the SMEs. And all of that basically, if you look at all these pillars, uh, all of them has something to do with digital and digital could affect all of these sectors. So uh, one of the main uh, outcome of our assessments we can notice that, um, so in West Bank Gaza, you, it's kind of fragmented. You have 3 million people living in, in West Bank, 2 million people living in Gaza. And it's a very high, uh, it's, a, it's a challenging political economy and a very complicated political environment. This for sure uh, impacts the way how you do business. This impacts everything. But I think like sometimes technology could at least uh, contribute to solving some of the problems. I can't say it will solve everything. Like connectivity is important. I mean, uh, many people in Gaza right now are getting some jobs uh, using like outsourcing, um, outsourcing jobs either in West Bank Gaza or like doing some freelancing. So thanks for the internet because the internet was able to give those people some opportunities to be able to work uh, in a very uh, difficult environment. Um, so if you look at the regulatory environment in in West Bank Gaza, it's not uh, it's not really conducive for uh, an evolving digital economy. Uh, there is a lot of um, gaps that exist in the legal framework. And uh, there is also because w West Bank Gaza have a very uh, special situation and there's a, a lack of legislative body. Basically, we don't have uh, an elected parliament that could uh, issue uh, uh, laws and regulations. Um, also, uh, there's a gap uh, in many of the laws that uh, that govern the consumer protection, the competition policy, the intellectual property, the trade law, and in many other standards and methodologies that could affect the digital ecosystem. So this is those are many of the issues basically that could hinder and uh, could serve as a barrier to ev any evolving digital uh, ecosystem in the world. Um, definitely, there is a, a clear uh, gender divide uh, or gender digital divide. Uh, women does not have equal access to internet and data as, as men. And if you look at the banking sector, we can find that um, there's 60% of uh, adults, they at least have one type of regulated deposit bank account, while, while only 29% of females or women have, have access to this bank account. And uh, for the 15% uh, of men, have access to a regulated credit account while only 4% only of women have access to uh, a credit account. 
with that, like you can see that also there's a lot of gap uh, that we need to uh, to bridge and to need to work on in, in our future uh, programs. Other than that, um, if we try to look at the uh, digital payments and the fintech, uh, cash is still widely used. And uh, frankly speaking, it's the, it's the preferred payment instrument for retail payments. Uh, people like they they uh, they trust they trust using cash and they don't they still don't trust the um, electronic payments. Uh, informal economy accounts for almost a third of the GDP, and this also contributes to the high use of cash. Um, people don't like use things basically that they don't know how to use. Uh, you, sometimes using cards and uh, payment cards or debit cards or credit cards is not something that they prefer to use. And when it comes to digital wallets, uh, at least we have uh, right now five digital wallets uh, uh, offered by five different companies. But still, people are not, it's not widely used among people because still people don't use it that much. They don't even understand how to use it. And this is also one of the things that we need, we need to work on in the future. Um, also, uh, movements between uh, Palestinian cities in West Bank and Gaza and in and out, it's not easy. So I think uh, this is one of the main barriers to, to e-commerce and trade in, in, in this country. Um, there is a, a growing interest uh, in, the, uh, the, in the young generation for IT. Many people are going for, to schools to learn uh, IT and uh, to get some degrees in, in, uh, in, uh, in IT. But uh, we still have a huge mismatch between uh, the outcome of the education system and the market needs. There is still a, a big gap. And when you look at the market and you look at, you look at the uh, private sector uh, and you ask them, like, uh, is there, do you have any capacity to train the people in order for you to hire them? Uh, also, you have, you'll find out that it's not, there's no much interest in training people in order to hire. And also, this is something maybe development agencies like USAID and other development agencies, we need to look at this. Well, because some of the companies also, we have to consider this. They are small and medium. They don't have the capacity and the resources to train people and hire. So, uh, so they want like they want someone who is ready to to be hired and to be fully functional within their positions. Um, the last but not the least is the um, when we talk about entrepreneurship system, uh, ecosystem in 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 West Bank Gaza, I can say it's an evolving ecosystem. Uh, we have at least uh, one venture capital. There are at least seventy five um, enablers and many. Many donors and many investors are looking at this sector, but I can say still, if it's a, still a fragmented uh, sector, uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in order for these uh, for the system uh, ecosystem to evolve and to to be able to produce uh, startup companies that could scale up and could have like uh, exits or IPOs or or to be acquired by uh, tech companies uh, outside of the country. So. Um, with that, I, I think that like holistically, I mean, the good, the good thing about the digital strategy and the digital ecosystem framework, it provides uh, the missions and uh, the, anyone who's interested in digital development, a holistic view of like, in order, uh, in order to develop the system, what we can do, what things do we need to look at in order to, uh, to have interventions to develop the sector. And as I think my colleagues Chow and Anella have said, we already had, um, uh, like interventions in the digital ecosystem. This is not the, the first time we're working in, in, in tech, uh, but it's uh, sometimes it's tailored either to health or education or, or private sector development. But we have never had like this kind of uh, holistic view and uh, if, if we were to look at. So once, once we had this framework, it was easier for us to understand how the, uh, the ecosystem works what are the dynamics and what are things that need to work on in order for the whole ecosystem to evolve? Uh, with that, uh, I would, I'm happy to answer your questions and uh, I would move to Mike, uh, to Garth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fadi. That was quite an incredible overview, I think, of every issue that I think probably every country is facing. You touched on the gender divide and government intransigence, which you heard from Chow. You touched on education, you talked on the private sector, digital finance, even how digitization impacts the movement of people. So there was really a lot there. I appreciate it. When, since we're recording this, I think I'm going to go back and listen to that again, because it was uh, uh, 
a, a worthy, worthy 10 minutes of information for us. Um, and so now I'd like to go to our fourth speaker, Kyle, coming from Rwanda. Thanks, Garth. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kyle McNally. I'm coming to you from uh, the USAID mission here in Kigali. Um, I'm going to give you a, a quick example of some of the work that the DDAs do within uh, the missions uh, throughout the world. But before I do that, I want to uh, give you the point of what I'm going to say in case I digress too much. Um, much of USAID's work, uh, no surprise to anyone attending this session, takes place in or at the very least touches upon the digital ecosystem. Um, and the role of DDAs is to uh, the digital development advisors is to bring some of that uh, knowledge of the technical, uh, the, the, the digital tools and technologies and processes um, uh, to the mission. Um, and this expertise and the related skill sets that we bring uh, complement the, the technical expertise and the skill sets that are already here the, in health and education and economy and all of the other experts that we already have uh, within our mission. And increasingly, uh, these complementary skill sets are, are needed more and more to make um, the kinds of interventions we're doing uh, a success. Um, so I'm going to take uh, just talk about one little example uh, from my work, and it's going to be in the health area. Um, the um, uh, Rwanda, uh, just to give a little bit of context, it's a fairly poor country. Um, it's, it scores fairly low on human development index and other indicators uh, of health, education, well-being. But the, the country has made a lot of uh, really large strides in the last 20 years. There's been steep declines in maternal and child mortality. Uh, Rwanda has a great um, community-based uh, health insurance uh, scheme. The HIV uh, pandemic is pretty well under control here. There's a lot of examples of, of uh, successes in, in the health realm that Rwanda should be proud of and USAID as well should be proud of with our implementing partners for helping the country uh, achieve some of these successes. But as always, um, there are a lot of challenges. One of the biggest challenges is expanding um, health services to the most vulnerable people here in the country. These are, you know, children under five who are uh, suffering, many of whom are suffering from stunting and malnutrition, rural women, people with disabilities, um, and a shared goal of the government of Rwanda and uh, USAID Rwanda is uh, to make sure that these uh, that health services uh, are delivered to these most vulnerable uh, people. And one way that USAID has supported this is through a training and mentoring of, of health providers, especially at the community level. Um, the community health worker program here in Rwanda has at least uh, two or three uh, community health workers, CHWs in every village for a total of over 50,000 uh, people. So it's quite a large uh, cadre of people that we, through different intervention, try to uh, train and, and, and mentor and give them tools to help them do their jobs. Um, the government of Rwanda here sees the digitization of this program as kind of the key next step to reaching more and more of these people. And, um, and you know, Rwanda has this great five-year health strategy that has many elements in common with the USAID's vision for digital health and the USAID digital strategy. So there's a lot of overlap and synergy with what the government of Rwanda wants and what USAID wants uh, in general. And recently, uh, the government asked USAID through one of our partners to um, essentially help support the rollout of a, a, an app for the community health workers. Um, and it's going to be a, a pilot, to start with a pilot, um, which I know uh, a lot of us cringe a little bit when we hear the word pilot, but this is um, something that was designed at scale, you know, to be a full scale deployment, um, reaching the entire country, but it's gonna start small and, you know, we'll take some lessons learned and, and build upon that with future versions. Um, so, um, um, it, my role in this kind of kind of rollout was, you know, I don't know anything about health. I don't even like going to the doctor for crying out loud. Um, but um, I do know a lot about building and deploying apps and, uh, and about uh, doing so here in uh, Rwanda. So my experience and my understanding of the digital ecosystem in Rwanda allows me to give advice to my colleagues about the best practices in software development and about um, how they should be applied given the ecosystem in Rwanda to the greatest effect. And um, even at the very least, I can help demystify some of the technical jargon they're hearing when, you know, these are doctors and masters in public health and people who have 20 plus years working with malaria and, and infectious diseases, but they may not know 
the jargon around software and apps and things like that. I can provide a lot of value just by demystifying it and explaining things to them and just making it a little easier for them to understand what our partner is trying to do. So this contribution frees them to focus more on uh, the other aspects of the intervention, the health related aspects, the uh, improving our relationship with the government, um, improving our relationship with the partner and working together to you know, move, the, move us towards our shared goals. Um, and hopefully, you know, uh, my contribution can just help um, help us reach our goals a little bit faster. Uh, and I think I'll end it there and to leave enough time for uh, questions and discussion. All right, well, thank you, Kyle. And yeah, e-health, I think, is one of the, the more advanced sectors when it comes to digitization. That and perhaps elections follow, and, and finance as well. Um, but you're right that the health experts need someone who understands apps, understands potential limitations and security issues. And so it's great that you're there in Rwanda bringing that um, expertise um, to the table as necessary. Um, so now we're going to go to uh, um, take a look at, we'll be able to see all our faces if we switch to that view. And we'll just have some question and answer period. I'm, I'm following the um, questions and there's a lot of very interesting questions. One I'd like to start with, I'll answer that somebody asked about our DDAs in every mission. And no, we would like to see DDAs in every mission. It's, it's a growing um, uh, initiative. And Kyle and Fadi and Lexi, who's in, we also, we didn't include Central and South America because it's about four in the morning where they're sitting. So we, we gave them the, the morning to sleep in or else we'd have people, we could have people from uh, Honduras and Guatemala and Peru here. Um, but we are starting a sort of a mixed model. Some full-time DDAs like Kyle, other DDAs who are sitting in a technical office, but supporting the entire mission. And we're hoping, us that work in the digital strategy from Washington, DC, that more and more missions will understand the importance of having someone like Kyle and Anella and Chow and Fadi to really support a mission-wide perspective on digitization. And the DECAs, I think, will highlight that aspect um, um, to mission directors and mission leadership, that it's not just a small part of, of the mission, but when it comes to cybersecurity and the threats from cybersecurity, when it comes to responsibly developing apps that won't compromise people's data, when it comes to supporting elections and agriculture committees, you know, wherever we work, digitization is there and we need experts to, to um, uh, support that. But there's another question that relates directly to that. And this is what I gets to the challenge of, of a DDA is how can a DDA, how can one person possibly know everything about digitization that the mission needs? And the answer is you can't. There's like, Kyle, you're a software guy. Um, Anella, you're a, an economic growth and environment person. Fadi, you've got your history and Chow as well. So you have your specializations. So how can one person possibly do that? So the question was, um, uh, let's see if I can find it. DDA sounds, sounds such like fun yet challenging role. I hope the fun part is true. Um, challenging definitely is true. Um, my team plays a similar function within our organization. Can our DDA panelists share a little bit about their backgrounds and what they think are the qualities and competencies that make DDA successful in your role? So what qualities and quantities should a DDA have? Anybody want to take that first? You can raise your hand and jump in. And can we switch to our panel view instead of speaker view, please? Mm, I can provide. Yeah, I can provide my tech. Uh, I think the, the number one quality that the DDA ha should have is uh, he or she should love technology. So sh maybe at, at the beginning, you don't know much but you would love to explore more about the subject and you're reaching out to different stakeholders and learn more. The more you learn, the more you like the subject and the more you know. So I think first of all, you, you need to love the subject that you are in, technology, innovation, um, a startup or kind.
a thing. You know, uh, secondly, that you should to know how to seek help. Um, help from private sector. You, you need to have a, a network. Uh, first, uh, private sector, local and international. You know, your colleagues at the embassy or your colleagues at other section of the USAID. I used to work for the embassy at the economic section. So I have a well network at the embassy and I know there's a lot of people there. They know a lot more about me, about cybersecurity and other things. So I, I can reach out to. So I think uh, the first and foremost is you need to love the technology and then want to learn more about it. And the second thing is you know how to seek help and create your network. So all you need is love. I think we can make a song about that. That's good. <clears throat> Go ahead, Fajr. Uh, I saw like Anella is raising her hand. Uh, so oh, okay. Go ahead. All right, Anella, go. Thank you, thank you, Fadi. Thank you, Gard. Uh, I actually totally agree with Chow, and I just wanted to to add uh, uh, something additional, and that is, um, I think that the 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 key. Uh, is actually openness because in order to have that uh, uh, network of people, you you have to to, to be open minded. You have to be open for for uh, uh, the ideas of others, and you have to have the courage actually to constant constantly go out of your comfort zone because that is what technology is actually going out of the comfort zone, and that is what what uh, everything related to. to to digitalization and digitization is so that is that is uh, actually something uh, that is th that I would like to add to, to what Chao said and of course love and of course uh, uh, love to technology love to um, love to to and of course committed to to uh, make a progress and make a, a, a positive impact. So Anella, how, how oh go ahead, Fadi. Yeah, uh, just like to, uh, to add to Anilas and, and Chow, I mean, like it's um, like when you talk about technology and, and digital development, uh, you know, like in uh, TSID, either you're working at the mission or the bureau, you're not working alone, right? Like there are a lot of technical offices and there's a lot of technical backstops and admin people and all of these people working together. So I can say the first important skill that you need to have in order to make your project work or move is team working. Uh, you need to understand what the, the people interests are, uh, how you can convince people to, uh, to adopt technology, to, to design interventions that have some digital tools. And if, uh, if you think that like uh, uh, designing a, a project that has, this, that, have, uh, that has digital tool is something uh, easy, it's not, it's not easy. It's, it's a hard sell actually sometimes because uh, still technology is new to the agency as an agency and digital development is actually, it's a new term to the agency. Like, you know, the USAID is, is famous for delivering uh, big infrastructure projects or delivering the humanitarian assistance. But when you talk about technology and digital development, even like at, uh, at the agency level, it's, it's less than 10 years old. So if you try to sell the idea of working in this sector to people who have been working in this agency for a long period of time, you have to convince them to, to do that. You have to make them uh, as passionate as you. You have to keep talking to them and sell them the idea of that if we invest in this, uh, in this sector, this will have a, a return on our investment for the future in all the sectors, health, education, economic development, even humanitarian assistance. So, I mean, I mean, Yes, I agree with Chow. It's like you need to be passionate about technology. You need to be open. You need to be uh, able to uh, to have a teamwork to work with everybody and to communicate clear, clearly. I mean, communication is a key to, uh, skill that you need because uh, you need to communicate about the impact of the intervention on, on, on all the stakeholders, even within the agency and all the other stakeholders in the development sector. Thanks, Kyle. Go ahead. I don't want to be left out, right? Um, the one last thing I would say, uh, and, it, and it, I agree with everything that the panelists have said so far, uh, don't try to fake it. Um, if you don't understand something, you don't know something, just admit it. We've all been there. There is too much to understand and know, even as an expert. My background is in software development. 
I've been doing it for over 20 years. Every day I run into something I don't know and I don't understand. Um, admit it and people will respect you for it and then put in the time to try to figure it out. That's it. But don't, don't put the pressure on yourself to think that you need to know everything, even about a narrow, uh, a narrower focus like e-health or something like that, because it's impossible and give yourself a break. That, that is great. I mean, it's the human element in all this that I think the DDAs bring it to. You said curiosity, passion, um, you know, teamwork, collaboration. I mean, that's what a DDA brings to the table. Not like I know the answer, but let's get together and find the answer. And this is how you do it. And then, then you build experience as you go. So it's not, it's not a one day, one year um, process. It's, it's a changing the way the mission thinks about development and, um, okay, the, uh, there's an excellent question. I don't know if we'll know the answer to it, but I think it's very important that we raise it and maybe there's a, a someone has thoughts on it. And one of the uh, viewers that asked, the talk around digital always focuses on digital services or internet, but what about um, uh, this cost of storage and computing in infrastructure that is too expensive for millions of small and medium enterprises in developing countries? Internet is just the flow of information but less than 1% of data centers are built in Africa. So I think it goes to the, the infrastructure um, inequities globally, and especially like storage of data is critical. And I did not know that only 1% of data centers are built in Africa, that's a, a, a problem. So I think we're getting at infrastructure and, um, and storage of information. How much does that factor into your conversations with uh, stakeholders and partners? And I know we're working on Digital Invest at USAID, so we're, we're looking at addressing this. So I think we just announced a large initiative yesterday. Um, but, oh, Charlie, you have your hand raised, thank you. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, digital infrastructure, I, I talk from Vietnam's experience. Uh, digital infrastructure uh, is, um, is, for sure it's very important, but it's also a very difficult and challenging uh, area too. Uh, for example, data center and data localization in Vietnam, there's a hot debate about the government, government requirement that all Vietnamese citizen data had to be located in Vietnam uh, because they, the government want more control over the data. However, whether so the Vietnam is still a communist country and people are still very afraid of the possibility of abusing government government parts to the data. So data localization, whether it's good for economic development or for free flow of data across the, the global or for democracy is still a debate. And um, uh, we, <laughs> we at USAID, we promote free, free, flow, free flow of data. And that means you do, we we think that for the uh, for the better development of Vietnam, yeah, the Vietnam should take like technology like cloud computing and allow cloud cloud computing and allow data freely flow from Vietnam to the outside world and from the outside world to Vietnam. So I think um, infrastructure, digital infrastructure, for sure, is very important, but it's also a challenging debate as well. Um, uh, we haven't got any project on that area, but we, we for sure we agree that it's very important uh, area. Adi, please. Yeah, I'd just like to add um, that, you know, the digital infrastructure is one of the main pillars under the digital ecosystem framework. And uh, the affordability of the access to internet and storing of the data, definitely, it's one of the things that we look at in, uh, in any of our assessments, either the DECA or any other assessment. And I am like, I think you mentioned the digital invest uh, initiative uh, under USAID. 
and also the, the DFC, Development Finance Corporation, is looking into ways to invest in, in, in infrastructure. So, I mean, um, it's definitely one of the things that we look at when, when we talk about digital ecosystems in, in the countries we're working in. And uh, it's, um, I agree with, uh, with, with the question is that it's not easy. It's not easy to, uh, to build these because there's, they, they, they require a huge investment. And sometimes you don't have the capacity, you don't have the capability, there's not much interest from investment, uh, uh, the investors in the country. So uh, you try to think about different ways to engage maybe other development agencies or other um, investing agencies to, to, uh, to share the risk. Because like, you know, risk sharing uh, to achieve development in, uh, income or development outcomes, sorry, I mean, it's something that DFC and, and USAID is looking into. So maybe it's something we can look at. On the other, the other side also, I mean, uh, Chow, I think raised, raised a very good point about like uh, the rules that uh, and the sensitivity about data localization. I mean, and how, how, uh, how secure the data will be if I'm going to store this data on a cloud. Uh, for example, I mean, we've been in, in discussion with many of the private sector companies in, in West Bank Gaza, and many of them, they still don't believe that, uh, they believe on storing their data on a cloud. And if it's going to be a cloud, they want to have a cloud inside the country, not even outside the country, which, uh, which I, could, I, could, I could understand. Like at the end of the day, it's a private sector, it's a very confidential information that they, they need to want to have this data secured and safe. So, I mean, Definitely, there's a there's a there's a opportunity for for investor or for development uh, uh, like World Bank or DFC to look into these uh, sectors and see how we can grow this sector like data storage. Thank you, Fabi. I'll I'll give a, an example from my experience when I was the e-governance lead in Ukraine, and we helped um, set up the Prozoro the e government e procurement system. And it, it was the, the great anti-corruption success at the time run by, you know, um, initially enthusiastic uh, reformers. And then the government passed a law saying, and it was stored on Amazon Cloud, all of, all of the procurement data. And then the government said, no, we need all government and personal data needs to be stored in Ukraine. And so it was a large investment of, by USAID to move it from the cloud to a very secure um, um, data storage center in Ukraine. And that was successful, but then the war started um, a few months ago, and now these data centers became vulnerable. So they had to quickly move it back to the cloud and get it out of the country. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of complexities um, and unexpected um, uh, situations you're gonna, you're gonna face with data storage, but it's such an important question because we need to look at the entire ecosystem. You're right, we can't just focus on users or digital literacy, things like that. We need to really focus on the, the complete spectrum. Um, so many good questions, so little time. I, I will ask a question about, um, um, monitoring and evaluation. How do you how do you set up an understanding of what you're doing? Is I, I'm not not the you know the um, specifics of how do you monitor and evaluate a specific program? That's too um, uh, specific for this conversation. But how do you measure success? How do how do you, even internally? Like how do you know that your digitization efforts are improving development outcomes and not making them worse. Do you have any systems or any thoughts on that? Monitoring evaluation is always the tough one because it's a really hard thing. Okay, monitoring evaluation, it's, it's, it's hard to know the the extent that digitization helped an outcome because it's part of something, a larger activity. And so I know we're working on monitoring evaluation plans, but is that a challenge that you face um, in, in your mission? Uh, Garth, I mean, yes. um, sometimes it's it sounds um, like from, it sounds easy to, to look at it or like to, to capture it. I mean, like you can, you can say, the number of people who were trained to do something or the number of systems who are uh, which are installed but i think the impact of digitization is much more than that if we really want to look at it's not like a short-term outcome or something it's just more like a long term 
I mean, like if you digitize and like it's, you have to see like what kind of, what, what kind of efficiency we have after, afterwards, after the, the installing the system, uh, how easy things are getting. Uh, it, could, it could be reflected in the number of transactions that are done uh, on a daily basis, on a monthly basis or in, or in a year basis. Uh, uh, but I mean, just if, if you want to look, really look, to look at, the, at this, at the, the impact of digitization, it's much more than the number of systems installed and the number of people trained, or the number of, uh, of uh, even like uh, in terms of digital wallets, uh, the number of users, let's say, for example. We could, and this is like the traditional way of capturing uh, the, the outcomes of projects. Uh, but I mean, again, I mean, if, if digit, digitization, it impact doesn't, doesn't show results. Uh, in the short term, sometimes it, it has to be long term because you have to think about three different stages. You have, first of all, like the installation and then the operational side and then adoption side. And, and really it takes a lot of time for people to adopt new technologies. I mean, there are many systems, uh, for example, even like uh, the, Zoom, the Zoom system we're using right now or Google Meet or any kind of uh, those meetings, uh, virtual meeting systems that have been in place for a while. I don't think if they were created or invented just like uh, during the pandemic, but uh, we didn't adopt them till we had the pandemic. So basically the, the pandemic accelerated the adoption of technology and maybe this is the good side of the pandemic, but even like when, when we talk about systems, either at the governmental level or at the private sector level, it will take some time for uh, change the user behavior and for, pe for people to adopt new systems and technologies. Garth, you, you are new. Thanks. Yeah, we're down to just one or two minutes. So I'll just give quick closing remarks. First, I wanna thank all of you um, for joining this panel and um, giving us your thoughts from the countries you work in. What's really coming out to me, I think, is the collaboration in, in all this, that a DDA cannot do everything. And our implementing partners are, are on this call, our uh, host country um, civil society organizations, the private sector that we didn't talk about, host country governments. There are so many different aspects to this that, and it's all about bringing everybody, the right people at the right time to the table to discuss these. And so as much as USAID can help facilitate this conversation, I think that's one of our greatest value adds. And one of the most important reasons that a DDA is in the country working to, as, as Chow said, bring curiosity to it, um, to bring uh, the technical skills. And as Fadi said, the collaboration, and that aspect of a DDA, I think, is the most important role. And I, I wish you all well. Thank you all to all the, our participants um, and for the excellent questions. We didn't have time to get to them all. There was good questions on data, like how do we open up data, data literacy. I wanted to talk more about the gender divide because several people brought it up here. There's a lot of uh, issues we didn't discuss, but I think we had a very good conversation today. And I want to thank the organizers of GDDF as well as um, all of the people that are curious and passionate about digitization. So thank you all very much. Have a great day, night, afternoon.